happy to have Marina Barba visiting us today. Some of you already met with her. Some of you will still get a chance. Lorena is visiting us from George Washington University um, in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering there. Before that, she was at BU, PhD from Caltech, um, and originally an undergraduate from Chile. Works on computational fluid dynamics, which is near and dear to many of our hearts. High performance computing, computational biophysics, and, and animal flight. I was going to ask you about that, because I just saw that. All right. All right. Yeah. And, um, I can talk to you about that. Well known for our courses as Open Educational Resources, recipient of the 2016 Lerner Rosenthal Award for the Open Social Sciences, nominated and honorable mention for the Open Education Awards for Excellence in the Open Education Consortium. And you're now on the non-focus board? Yes, yeah, so I'm a member of the board for non-focus. Uh, member of the board for non-focus. Okay. So let's give uh, Lorena a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming here after lunch. Um, it's, just, uh, it's a real pressure to come to Long Island and uh, visit you and have a chance to have a conversation with you about this topic of reproducibility. And um, well, I hope that is going to be interesting to you, some of the thinking that has gone into this topic uh, from my point of view. And um, I, I will be very happy to have your feedback and questions at any point. The topic, in fact, I would say, has hit the mainstream. Uh, it is really now, um, in, 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 in many venues have had, you know, the top glossy magazines in science have had cover features and editorials about the subject. Let me mention a few ones. For example, just last year, the National Science Foundation Computer and Information Sciences uh, Directorate um, uh, released this Dear Colleague letter citing this growing concern about the standards of reproducibility and rigor in research. Uh, it's worth a read, uh, and it, because it, for, it mentions, it brings to light really something that is very uh, crucial in this topic, which is the contrary influences between a bias towards positive results for, pu for publication, the com competition uh, in science to rush perhaps to finding and to findings and to put them in print, Overemphasis in presenting conceptual breakthroughs and in high impact journals and so on, which goes contrary to this idea of doing research in a rigorous fashion, taking the time that it takes to actually ensure that our processes are uh, tested and correct. So this dear colleague letter encourages PIs to, this, to embrace the idea of transparency, um, to develop rigorous methods in computing, and also making as much as possible, all of the experimental environments and parameters and collected data available uh, to other researchers. Uh, thinking that NSF has funded this research, of course, they're interested in uh, increasing the impact of that through transparency and open science. The NSF also made a commitment through this dear colleague letter to invest, and you can cite this DCL in your uh, proposals uh, as a reason for doing perhaps some uh, extra work in this area. In particular now, the um, subcommittee on replicabil replicability in science of the uh, advisory committee for the social sciences, and so social and behavioral um, uh, and economic sciences section of the NSF published a more thorough treatment of this topic. And they um, offer some um, consensus on terminology, for example, the um, definitions that we might want to adopt uh, in regards to the idea of reproducibility versus uh, the word replicability. So they propose uh, a definition for reproducibility as um, the idea that a researcher, uh, another researcher may be able to duplicate results of a prior study. Uh, using the same materials, the same data that was used by the original researcher. And uh, they propose that when new evidence is provided by perhaps new methods, new exper experiments, a new study uh, that confirms a scientific finding, then we, are, we can refer to that as replicating the study, replication. So they make a distinction between these two terms, and this is quite um, still... A, uh, not, defi not uh, definitive, and there's quite some arguments about uh, these definitions, but 
for CFD people, we understand, for example, that at some point in the history of CFD, we made a distinction between validation and verification. And it is useful to us to say, you know, that uh, verification is to know whether you have solved the equations right, and validation is whether you're solving the right equations. Uh, so it's, there's a difference there. Uh, in, 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 in meaning that is useful to us to structure the way that we study our, 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 uh, our methods. So in that same sense, that this subtle dif distinction between reproducibility and replicability or replication studies could be useful as well. And this report does state that reproducibility in that sense is a minimum necessary condition for a finding to be, tr to be trusted because Sometimes a replication study might not be possible to do. For example, if you have an opportunistic uh, result for, for an epidemiology study, you're, you're not going to be able to find those same conditions again to do a complete replication because the thing happened at one point in time. But if the whole study was done reproducibly and all the data is available and all the code is available, then you have more trust in those findings, even though they cannot be fully replicated. So reproducibility is a minimum standard in that sense. I want to mention also that the NIH has a broad effort in the idea with a whole section on their website dedicated to this issue. Um, of course, their focus is on preclinical research, and it's not uh, relevant for, for, for all of us here in the room, but I mention it because NIH is the largest U.S. government-funded uh, funder of research. And so uh, I think it is uh, important to note that they also have a very, very broad um, de uh, dedication to this, to this question. They've organized many workshops and community awareness efforts, uh, meetings, and so on. Uh, they've published reports. Um, they've um, had um, um, interactions with editors of journals, like in science. Uh, uh, you know, they have direct uh, communications with those editors to establish certain standards and change our publication requirements for reproducibility. So there's. Quite a lot of information on their website. In particular, I want to point out uh, this quote, when a result can be reproduced by multiple scientists, it validates the original results and uh, uh, the readiness to progress to the next phase of research. So um, this is, uh, uh, of course, of great interest to the funders. Also, the National Academies have held as well workshops and published various reports to focus on reproducibility. And I highlight the workshop on statistical challenges that was sponsored by the NSF, held on February 2015 and published in 2016. And um, uh, they've had recurring events, but this is actually worth a read if you're interested and uh, interested in this topic. It's all available on the National Academy's website, and you can download it for free. In the area of high-performance computing, the Supercomputing Conference uh, has commenced efforts to promote and support replication and reproducibility efforts. The student cluster competition that is held every year in the supercomputing conference included a challenge uh, in 2016 to test the reproducibility of a previous, of the results of a previously published paper in the supercomputing conference. Uh, that happened for the first time, uh, I think it was last year. And um, also last year there was a panel uh, on Addressing reproducibility, which filled a large lecture room and included a lot of EAPs in the community, and I was um, uh, I was proud to be part of that panel as well. Here in this picture, you see me with um, uh, uh, Jim Demel and Mike Haru from Sandia, and uh, so it was a it's a conversation that is now sort of going up the um, uh, echelons of the high performance computing community as well. Science published, uh, this is something that I recommend as well, in 2015, uh, the, what, the, what is called the Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines. These are um, guidelines that have been signed so far by, by about 3,000 journals and um, uh, professional societies that plainly link reproducibility to sharing data, code, research design and procedures, disclosing um, uh, you know, pre-registering uh, uh, studies. And um, they establish a um, set of standards. There are eight modular standards, each one with three levels of in increasing stringency. And so journals can select from the eight 
transparency standards to adopt and select a level of implementation that they are going to commit to. So it gives a very uh, a good structure for journals to locate themselves on what the requirements are going to be and perhaps establish some ambition to uh, in, in, um, make their standards more stringent over time and establish some, some planning about that. The signatory organizations include the AAA, AAAS, um, the American Meteorological um, Society, not many CFD uh, uh, community organizations there, uh, not AIAA, not ASME or APS yet, but uh, there are a couple of uh, journals that are relevant to us. The um, uh, Springer's Theoretical and Computational Fluid Dynamics Journal has signed to the top guidelines, and, so, and, and, and this is increasing. Increasingly more journals are, are uh, becoming signatories. Nature published, is, has published an ongoing collection of articles about this subject and editorials and so on. And they uh, make it very plain that both uh, that journals, scientists, institutions, and funders all have a joint uh, part in tackling this issue of reproducibility. Nature, in particular, has taken substantive st uh, steps to improve the transparency um, of what they publish and to promote awareness of the topic. And in May 2016, they published a survey of more than 15,000 researchers. And uh, it showed that 70% of the people surveyed said that they had trialed and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. More than half had failed to reproduce their own previous results. And 52% um, <laughs> agree that there's a significant crisis of reproducibility. So, more than half of respondents agree it's a significant crisis and, uh, and, and certainly it's now become quite a bit of a, a, a vocal movement, I would say. Has anyone tried to reproduce the survey? <laughs> Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Yes. Yes, engineers, chemistry, biology. Or so so the, the different communities, of course, if they break it down, it turns out engineers are very... Uh, confident of their work in comparison to biologists and so things like that. You can, it's very interesting to look at the uh, breakdown of the, of the data that they show, yes. Yeah. I wanted to mention a couple of efforts that I'm involved in in this area. One is the uh, Technical Consortium on High Performance Computing of the IEEE now has a new initiative on reproducibility. I'm leading that with the chair of the TCHPC. And we're going to be... Um, um, making contact with the editors-in-chief of all the IEEE journals, or maybe a subset of them, and uh, asking them about their concerns about reproducibility, if they've had an editorial in their journal, and trying to collect information from the IEEE co community and centralizing that uh, uh, through, through TH, uh, TCHPC in particular, uh, with, with thinking about the, the implications for high-performance computing. And also the IEEE AIP uh, magazine Computing in Science and Engineering now has a new track that I am uh, co-editing with George, uh, the previous editor-in-chief of SICE, on reproducible research. And the plan for this, this has just been announced uh, literally a, a month or a few weeks ago, uh, the plan for this is to publish um, uh, three different kinds of articles. One, um, a, a traditional research article that is particularly um, rigorous in its reproducibility practice and that, that uh, follows a certain set of minimum standards is going to be eligible for this track. Second, short case studies that report on attempts to replicate some other results, either whether they, whether they failed or succeeded. And these are going to be fast-tracked through the editorial review uh, with the idea of inviting, for example, people from labs. There's a lot of experience in the labs uh, in regards to this topic, and they don't have the same pressures to publish that we do in academia. So we want to uh, bring these communities into to, to, to this conversation. And uh, the third type of articles is in a sort of column type uh, uh, on tools, libraries, and techniques. So if you have a particular tool that facilitates reproducibility, it can be reported there, new, uh, or particular techniques about reproducible research. This is the working definition that we have adopted in my group about reproducibility. It is inspired by John Clairbout, uh, the senior author there uh, of this paper that appeared in SICE, Computing in Science and Engineering, uh, in 2000. 
the idea is authors provide all the necessary data and the computer codes to run the analysis again, recreating the results that have been published. So it does rely on open source and open data. Uh, but that is not all there is for reproducible research. Here's a picture of John Clare about, I like to include it because he looks like Santa Claus and so he's very trustworthy. Uh, and and uh, his invited paper uh, presented in the 1992 meeting of the, Social, the Society of Exploration Geophysics included the first appearance, as far as I know, of the term reproducible research in a scholarly pu publication. This is 1992, so 25 years ago. And his idea of reproducible research was to leave any finished work, a PhD thesis, for example, in a state where any co-worker or member of the group can reproduce the calculation, the analysis, and the final figures that appear in that document. In his case, he required his students to be able to do that with one make command. So he was using make at that time, and the idea was all of the figures in your thesis should be reproducible with one command. Think about your latest report or article that you published and tell me how long it would take you to reproduce every figure of that. Just think about it for a moment. That is a hefty goal. It was 25 years ago, and I think that people are still trying to live up to this uh, expectation that he put on his graduate students. And um, here is, uh, forgive me for the small font, but uh, I wanted to include the uh, goals that uh, he set for his group. The idea of merging a publication with its underlying computational analysis. This is very avant-garde, it feels, today. It's 25 years ago that he was asking for this. Teaching researchers how to prepare a document in a form where they themselves can reproduce their own research results a year, two weeks from now, perhaps it's even hard, right? Learn how to live finished work in a condition where co-workers can reproduce. Prepare a complete copy of our local software environments so that graduating students can take their work away with them to other sites. Press a button and reproduce their work at Stanford. By the way, uh, Claire Bart was a leader in uh, signal processing and um, uh, in, in the area of geophysics. Merge electronic documents uh, written by multiple authors. Uh, of course, if we write papers on GitHub today, that doesn't seem so hard, but GitHub didn't exist back then. Export electronic documents to numerous other sites so that they can readily reproduce a, uh, a portion of their research. These were the requirements, the goals that he set for his lab 25 years ago. So think about your latest report and how long it might take for a colleague to reproduce your results. In contrast, replication, uh, as adopted by the National Science Foundation, at least the SBE directorate, is this idea that you can arrive at the same scientific finding of a previous study, but perhaps collecting new data, perhaps using new methods, uh, or maybe just independently in some way, uh, with an independent group in a different location. So this, this um, now uh, is the idea that um, um, uh, you can build upon the previous evidence uh, so that scientific findings are more trustable. And it's, just, uh, of course, very important, especially in areas uh, that are uh, somewhat controversial um, areas of science that may be somewhat controversial, this building up of trust by having several studies that confirm the findings. Sometimes, as I said previously, it might be impossible to do because the, there's no, it's not possible to collect new data on something that has happened already. But reproducibility, on the other hand, is really only limited by the effort that we're willing to, to put in. So why is it that uh, we care about this topic? Uh, especially in computational research. And, well, the, the, the issue is that we are using computing, we're using computation to create scientific knowledge. We are using it as part of the scientific enterprise. And what is science? Well, according to um, the, American physical, the American Physical Society in their Ethics and Values document of 1999, the success and credibility of science are an an anchored I mean, that's where my native, uh, non-native speaker uh, comes out. In the willingness of scientists to expose their ideas and results to independent testing and replication by others. And this requires the open exchange of data, procedures, and materials. 1997. So genuine reproducible research is not just privately reproducible, like in the case of the Stanford lab where the students 
we're able to reproduce each other's work, but also publicly reproducible so that other researchers may build from your work. We care about this because uh, if we don't do it, some bad things can happen as well. The journal Nature published this feature in uh, 2010 already about computation in particular, the role of computation in science. And the article mentions that coding problems can sometimes cause a lot of harm um, and, and have forced some scientists to even retract some papers. Um, it tells the story of a structural biology group at Scripps Institute led by Geoffrey uh, Chang that in 2006 the team realized that a code that they were using had a sign error. This reversed two columns of data and it forced them, and it caused protein structures to be completely wrong, and it forced them to retract a series of papers. They, the five papers that they had to retract were published in Science, the Journal of Molecular Biology, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences between the years 2001 and 2005. So this is the nightmare scenario, okay? Your code has a bug. It's a sign error and you have to retract five papers from the top journals in science. And you don't want that to happen to you. <laughs> Retraction Watch had uh, this uh, a case that I, I picked off just last year. It continues to happen. A paper published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology um, contained analysis that mislabeled a data um, in a column, and uh, that affected how sets of clinical results from uh, decades of study uh, um, into uh, 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 cancer research uh, were uh, uh, arrived at the wrong conclusions, forcing the uh, papers to be retracted. The principal investigator said that the coding error was made by a doctoral student and nothing more. No details were given. We don't know what coding error it is, so we don't know the detail. You could just say that this is bad luck, that the, B, the PI couldn't really have avoided this. I mean, anybody could make an error. Mistakes do happen. But the fact is, is that there are engineering practices that ensure quality of research software. And those could have prevented this problem. Those practices are part of what we call reproducible research. They include version control, code reviews, code testing, study replication by others, and so on. So. Yes, it was bad luck, but we, we, there are methods to avoid these kinds of problems. This is a, also a, a case that is worthy of noting. Two economists at, two economists at Harvard University uh, published a study in 2010 titled uh, Growth in a Time of Debt. This study suggested a negative effect of growth um, from the national debt. It appeared in a non-peer-reviewed issue of the American Economic Review. And this study was the um, uh, main motivation for austerity measures that, have been, that were taken after that. Um, it was widely cited by fiscal conservative politicians. And Paul Krugman here, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist, called it the most influential economic analysis of recent years. Well, it had an error. Uh, in addition to some creative statistics, I believe, uh, there, was, there was an error in the spreadsheet. A very serious program that was found only when other researchers tried to replicate the results, asked the original researchers for the data, the researchers sent the Excel spreadsheet, and um, some graduate students, in fact, couldn't reproduce, couldn't reproduce the results, and until uh, they found that apparently some, some had excluded some cells out of 26 countries, say, uh, they only included, uh, I don't remember the number, and that completely changed the conclusions. Uh, an Excel error. So here is another uh, mention of these uh, uh, Excel errors that can happen. Uh, I have a, a, an acquaintance in uh, UC Berkeley that uh, tweeted, and I have a screenshot, but I forgot to include it in this talk. Uh, he tweeted that uh, using Excel for crucial data analysis is like driving drunk. No matter how carefully you do it, 
it's irresponsible and a crash is likely. <laughs> so that's my opinion on Excel for data analysis. I share his opinion. Then here's another spreadsheet horror story. Um, well, in genomics, researchers estimate that one out of five publications using Excel contain errors. The problem here is that Excel automatically converts some gene names to other formats. Like, for example, the gene name might say JAN18. Well, that looks like a date. Let me convert that into a date for you. That's, and so it happens. Excel will turn that into a date or a floating point number because it looks like a floating point number, but it's really a gene name. So, I don't know, 23109E3 gets converted to a floating point number where E3 is, the, uh, you know, to the power 3, but E3 is just part of the name. So apparently, 20% of papers, is, uh, according to this estimate, in the area of genomics are wrong because of Excel errors. So the question next is, how do we deal with this? So how, you know, what, what can we do? The first element of Re uh, reproducible research is transparency. Transparency and open science. And these are essential. Embracing open science is the best route to increasing reproducibility. Um, Stanford professor David Donohoe uh, cited there at the bottom of my slide and co-workers, uh, in my opinion, according to what I've read, are the first group to publicly state that reproducibility depends on open code and open data. They make a very concrete relationship between transparency and openness and reproducibility. Uh, they define reproducible computational research in the same manner as ClearBout, that in which all details of the computations, including code and data, are made conveniently available to others. The word conveniently is crucial there because it doesn't mean uh, the data will be available upon request, okay, because that upon request sometimes means that, well, when you get the request, the postdoc left. I don't know where the data is. So at the moment of publication, you need to put the data and software out there in a permanent repository that does not depend on the postdoc being present uh, when you get that email. So they take, uh, David Donohoe and his group, a statistician at uh, Stanford, does take inspiration for professional, for uh, professional Claire about in their idea of reproducible research. Uh, the Yale Law School Roundtable in November 2009 came with a statement urging for more transparency in computational sciences, and they define reproducible research, reproducible computational research unambiguously as that that makes available all details of the code and data. Uh, the recommendations include various things like assigning a unique identifier to every version of the code, um, describing in each publication the computing environment used, Code and data is not enough in a uh, computational um, uh, experiment. There are many other things that are relevant, like this, the, 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 the uh, system that was used and the, uh, uh, all of the compiler uh, options that were used. And there are many things about the software environment that need to be recorded as well with the software. Using open licenses whenever, uh, whenever possible and not proprietary formats and publishing under open access conditions using, as, uh, whenever possible, preprints as well. So, um, subscribing to these recommendations, by the way, of the Yale uh, Roundtable means that we do need to learn about software licensing and data management. I do recommend that all of us managing software should have a working understanding of software licensing. So, what is an open license? This is the definition of... Uh, open source licenses. Uh, no, sorry, I don't have the definition here, but um, uh, this is an interpretation um, um, of what really we achieve with open source licenses. Uh, of course, an open source license it does, doesn't mean that you, open source does not mean that you put the code out there to, for people to read. It means that you have assigned a license which anticipates the use of that software by others and gives permission for that. So in that way, it is a, um, it's, it's a very creative invention that works within the confines of copyright law and allows people to coordinate their work, making access a priority. 
this is, I think, in a nugget, what open source licenses do. And freedom, in this sense, the freedom to coordinate your work um, is, is power. It, uh, and power also comes with some responsibility. So it's not about reading the code. It's, it's something different. It's important to understand the distinction. Um, we must attach a license that allows others to modify and distribute the code. And people in open source world that understand this, if they run into your repository, regardless of how useful your software is, if it doesn't have a license attached to it, they won't use it. They won't touch it because they understand that the software actually has copyright attached to it. And if you haven't put a license to it, they're not allowed to use it. So they, they won't because uh, there are legal implications. So you should put always uh, an open source license and understand which one is the most uh, appropriate license for your work. Also, another aspect of this is preprints. Uh, the fast dissemination of information is important, and preprints facilitate that. This is the idea of green open access. You don't have to pay thousands of dollars to have your paper published in an open uh, access journal if that's not what you, if that's not the best journal for you or you don't have the funds. But you can find uh, journals that will allow you to submit your paper if it was pre previously deposited, deposited on a preprint server. And certainly the growth of archive demonstrates that this is really um, uh, accepted more and more. Uh, Archive is a way of life in physics and in applied mathematics and some areas uh, of comput computer science as well. And it's increasingly being adopted in other um, uh, subjects as well. Now we have bioarchive, SOC archive, uh, OSF preprints also hosts uh, preprint uh, pre servers for other specific topics and engineering, engineering archive. So it is being more widely adopted. And uh, the idea of preprints, of course, is that you, your work, at some point where you consider it worthy to share, perhaps at some point where you're close to having a submission ready for a journal, you might decide that your preprint is readable by others. You consider it almost publication quality, but you're going to go through the peer review process. Um, a majority of papers that get deposited in an archive and do end up in a peer review journal. But two years later or one year later. So you do want that information to be available early on for the possibility of, of getting feedback from your community. But beyond open source code and uh, preprints and green open access, there are other things that you can do. This is one thing that, uh, we, can, that we do in, in, in our research group. We create what we call the reproducibility package. Uh, or repro pack for short and for cute. Um, this is the idea of making a file bundle with the uh, raw data, the plotting script, and the figure that is produced, and putting this file bundle into a data archival site. We use Figshare. And by putting it on Figshare, we are attaching a CC BY license to that file bundle and getting a digital object identifier. Fixture also gives me uh, assurance that that's going to be available. Uh, and the archival quality that is accepted in libraries is 10 years. They guarantee that. And um, at the moment that we, so we edit our paper before submission. We do this before submission. And so at the, in the caption of the journal, we cite the file bundle that has been deposited on Figshare with its DOI, saying that the figure is used under CC BY. So then we submit the paper. The paper goes through peer review. If we're lucky, it gets accepted. And eventually, it's going to have to sign that copyright transfer agreement for the journal, right? I signed that copyright transfer agreement, but my figures are already licensed under CC BY. And they don't, they, they, I'm using it in my own paper with the license that I already ascribed to it, which means anybody else can use them as well. So there's no need for anyone that wants to reuse my figures to ask permission to the journal. So we've skirted a little bit those hurdles that journals put on our uh, path to be able to reuse data and figures. Because maybe you want to reproduce the work and you want to compare directly with the data. The data's there. You want to do the same plot with the same um, look so that you can compare directly. That figure is there. You can actually put it in your own paper without asking permission because I've already pre-authorized you to use it under a CC BY license. Uh, we think this is a pretty cool trick. and uh, I. I Nobody's ever complained. We've published 
uh, several papers like that, and nobody's ever complained. I think it's a pretty neat trick, so I like to share it. When you sign the copyright, do you tell them all that? No. It's in the, it's in the caption. It's in the references, and the copyright agreement usually says that um, if, you're re if the author is responsible for getting pre-authorization for any materials, blah, 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 that are previously copyrighted, right? There, I did it myself, to me, <laughs> and to others. <laughs> I haven't had to do that in the journals that I publish. Um, you could try it. I, the first time I did it, I was a little bit scared. Uh, then I got like increasingly more relaxed about it when nobody complained. It was Elsevier. It was known to be uh, pretty draconian about copyright, uh, but there was no problem. And then just last year, I actually ran it through my university general counsel. and said, look, I've been doing this for about five years. What do you think about this? I said, <laughs> And they, and they said, oh, I don't know, send me some examples of copyright transfer agreements. And I did. And after a few weeks and a few dozen emails, the, she came back and said, you know what? I think this is um, totally legit because uh, they, it, once you sign the copyright transfer, that does not undo a previous licensing that has been uh, uh, attached to that object. So that's the kind of things that you can do. Leaves the figures open for future uh, uh, colleagues to reuse and uh, under the license terms. So this is the idea. We write the paper, zip all the figures, upload, get a DOI on fixture, uh, share under CC BY, and then cite in your own paper. I want to also mention the Journal of Open Source Software because I am one of the founding editors of the Journal of Open Source Software. And one of the issues that we have is the perverse incentives in our, the academic uh, world for, um, that, that, that do not really ascribe credit to uh, software uh, outputs and, and, and creations by people. Software is a very valuable research um, uh, output. And it doesn't get recognized by itself. You can, you know, you can have your software openly available on GitHub, but you can put that on, CV, on your CV and nobody's going to pay attention. But um, so that is, is, is one of the reasons people bring up for not investing time in making the software readable by others, putting it on GitHub, documenting it properly so others can download, install it, and so on. So what the Journal of Open uh, Source software offers is a venue for publishing a paper on your software. It doesn't mean that you have to get other scientific results and a new finding using your software and make that the citation that you require whenever people use your software. It's a separate paper just on the software and the peer review happens on the software. The reviewers will download the software, do code review, check that you have documentation and give you feedback on the code improve code quality, and once it gets accepted, there is a um, actual cross-ref DOI attached to the paper, and um, um, the paper itself could be a page and a half describing really what the code does, uh, what its research application is, and maybe citing any uh, other publications where it has been used for a research output, but it is uh, the software is the object that gets reviewed. Yes? Nope. No, because uh, you're, is there are different uh, research, there are different bits of work that are different. I mean, sometimes you may have imagine that you have a code and you do grid convergence analysis and you have a lot of results that actually validate and verify that the code is correct and you publish that in one type of journal and then you use the code for getting some specific uh, science and you publish that in another type of journal and this is the same thing where we're not here publishing the grid convergence analysis or the validation, you're publishing a paper about the software and the review is done on the software. Correct, correct, before or after.
whatever you prefer. Bef maybe before, because then your paper in Astrophysics Journal with the validation and verification and the method and the mathematics and all of that will cite this paper. You get your first citation. Well, it's a still citation, but it's still you know an, an avenue to draw people towards the to, towards your uh, your Is group's there, output. Will this host a it doesn't host a repository for the code. It makes a direct link between the DOI. So it, what it asks you to do is you have your repository, uh, say on GitHub or a Bitbucket, and uh, you sub make, make a submission to the Journal of Open Source Software. It goes through, a, through the peer review on the software, then they check all of the things that I mentioned, and then you're asked to place a, to deposit a full archive with a release of the software on Zenodo. Zenodo gives a DOI for the software archive and this gives you a DOI for the paper and those crossref now can uh, link the DOIs and so we get a linked DOI uh, between the software object on an archival because of course github is not enough because you can always delete a repository from github right as an author so it is required that you add, when it's accepted that the software be deposited in an archival quality data repository like Zenodo or it could be Figshare as well or another one like Data Dryad or something that guarantees 10 year um, uh, survival of that object. Yes? How does this work with multiple versions of the same software if you make substantial improvements 